morning, everyone. Glad to see you, and you all have first-class seating today, so you can kind of stretch out a little bit and uh, let your legs, uh, you know, get some circulation in them. So, by the way, uh, hello to our friends at home. So I know many of you are at home. Uh, glad that you're joining us online, and perhaps you can say hello in the chat room. And by the way, there are notes for you uh, online, and you're going to need them today. And if you haven't grabbed the notes, you're going to need them today because I am batting cleanup for this entire series. And I'm like, stop putting so much in this message, but I couldn't help it. Well, actually, I restrained, so you'd be very proud of me. But uh, I have been praying for us today that the Lord would direct me and he would open our hearts to receive from his word. And what a joy it is to worship together. Can I say amen there, right? Our church meetings are unlike any other meeting that we uh, go to, any other gathering of any people, be it a concert or a dinner party or a work event or friends. When we come together uh, like this, uh, there's something dynamic, something supernatural when the Lord's people gather to worship him and gather to hear from him and your ministry matters right when you're not here it we feel it right we don't hear your voice we don't sense your presence we don't see your smile every sunday you have something to do you say well i'm not formally you know a greeter or an usher or i'm not whatever guess what your job is to love the lord your god with all your heart soul mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And so, yeah, the ministry matters. Your life matters. So, so good to see you. And uh, again, hello to all of you who are online. And we should give special, um, let's see, honor to those who helped move all the snow today. So if you do not know uh, Fred Holmertz, he's the guy, he's the donut man. So you'll see him back there with his crosspoint apron. Okay, he's way more than a donut guy, right? He does that. He takes care of this whole place. He was here early. You know, he's 70 something two three I think he's three and you notice how fit he is okay that just doesn't happen by accident right he works a lot so thank you to Fred for doing that and then Caleb showed up and Jake Rogers right here Jake put a hand up uh, I know Jake he's back here so he plowed things out and Caleb showed up and Kenton Lee showed up and others showed up to help uh, clean up our spot so thank you to all of them also, thank you last week to Mr. Michael. You did a great job. Really appreciate you bringing the word for us. And um, he's a gift to me. He's a gift to all of us and loves the Lord, loves his wife, of course, loves his church family and our community, and grateful for God bringing him to us or them to us. And you're going to hear more from him. So we'll you know, get him up more and get some others up more. But thank you for bringing that message. It was really, actually... <laughs> It was amazing. My wife and I have not sat, sat together in the church we belong to for probably 15 years, and we were sitting right over there, and it was super wonderful, and it was kind of weird, actually, to do this. I'm like, oh, this is what it's like? I'm like, this is pretty nice. So thank you for giving us that time to be together. Uh, one other thing, and then we'll jump into the word. Um, so our, our me and our congregation, as you know, at 1 o'clock, there is a congregation meets. It's here. Um, it's in Burmese, and wonderful people. Their stories are incredible. Their life is incredible. What God has done in them and what God is doing through them is really incredible. There has been, if you, most of you are aware, but maybe not everybody, uh, there has been a war, a coup actually, happening in their country. And so we have been praying um, for that country and for those. They have parents and brothers and sisters and nieces and nephews and, and people there. They've been sending money, and Pastor Key does a Zoom Bible study with people literally in the jungle. He does that on Friday nights, time zone. He does all this. And uh, just this last week, so most of our folks are from a province that the military now is really pushing in. And so there is heightened concern for their relatives, and so they ask, hey, can we pray for Myanmar? And so we're going we're gonna to pause, we're going to do that in this, in this service. And so if you think about it, you know, put, it, put a reminder somewhere, because we're connected to them personally. And um, we're going to pray for them, and we're gonna, I'll pray for the service, and we'll move on. So let's just pray together. So God, we are grateful for the real privilege of being together to praise you, God. Despite cold and snow, 
God, we value gathering together. We value singing together and hearing together and loving one another. God, so grateful for what you're doing in this place, in this congregation, and in your church throughout the world. This morning, Father, we are adding our prayers to literally millions of those who are praying for the conflict, the war happening in Myanmar. God, we thank you for the testimony of our friends, part of this congregation, God, who have given, who have fled, who pray, who cry, who have seen relatives um, die, some being killed in this conflict. God, as the military is pushing into their providence, Father, we ask for your providence, God, that you would, God, that you would protect, that uh, you would give real wisdom to the leaders, church leaders in particular, God, how to best shepherd their people, God, wisdom for the families, do they stay, do they go, do they resist, do they not? God, we ask for mercy. God, we ask that you would help this war, this conflict, whatever's driving it, and so complicated, God, but it's not complicated to you, God. This, Lord, we're asking for mercy, mercy and grace for these folks, mercy and grace, God, for that country, you deliver them. God, there's other things happening around the world. Of course, we think of Ukraine and the battle that continues to rage on, and in other places around the world, and especially places that are persecuted, uh, for people who are persecuted because they have faith in you. God, we ask for perseverance, we ask for grace, God, we ask for continued faith, God, we ask that you would meet with them today in a special way. And God, as we continue to open the word in this service this morning, God, I ask for your help, Lord, help me to speak your um, mind, what is true from your word, God, but also with your heart, God, to speak it in a way that, that is of your heart. God, help what is spoken today um, land in hearts that are open, God, and thank you for your work among us. And God, meet everybody today, and they're coming with different things going on in their life, different things going on in their body, perhaps. God, I ask that you would continue to meet with us, that you would speak to us, that you do your work among us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so... If you have your Bible, there it is, and if you have notes, you can follow along there, and again, there is a lot of stuff today. Um, the name of this message is called Instructions for Life, and if you noticed, as we talk about money and possessions in light of eternity, it's way more than your money and possessions, right? It's really ultimately about our heart, and it's about our mind, it's about our faith, and how we put that into practice when it comes to stewarding our life in its various ways, and in particular, we're talking about money and possessions. So it's a very important topic, and my hope is that you would be convinced of what the Bible says, not about what I say or what we believe, but what the Bible says. And so we spent three weeks, and this will be the fourth week. Lots more stuff to cover. This is no way exhaustive, and it's no way covering everything in detail. And so I encourage you to continue to study, to continue to read. As you read your Bible, look for this topic. And there's wonderful Bible teachers, some really great resources that go really deep on this subject. And I encourage you to read them, to listen to them, to watch things, to be convinced of what is in the Bible. And then ask God for wisdom courage or whatever is needed to follow through with those convictions. So that's my hope for all of us. And by the way, so next week we're going to be starting a new series and we're going to go to the Gospel of John. So we're going to do 16 weeks. We could probably do 60 weeks. We could probably do 16 weeks in the first chapter, but we're going to take 16 weeks to go through six chapters of the Gospel of John and we're going to just go through that book. So if you're thinking about the future, um, hey, start reading reading the Gospel of John. Just read it slow, and we're going to take some time in these words, and there's 
incredible uh, information about in Revelation about who Christ is, what it is to worship God in spirit and truth, what it is to follow after him. And my hope is, and I trust, that you'll be encouraged, you'll be strengthened, you'll be conformed uh, into the image of Christ as we go through that series, which is going to lead us all the way to the end of May, and then we're going to switch gears for our summer series. So that's what's upcoming. But today, we are in this passage. So again, if you have a Bible, go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. And we're going to look at verse 17, 18, and 19 through just three verses. And so I'm anchoring the message in this passage, and I'm just going to work my way through it. And this passage actually has seven takeaways. And so last week you had a marvelous one-point sermon. This week you're going to have hopefully a sermon with a point, but it'll have seven points, okay, which is a lot, right? But this is all in this passage. And so we're just going to work through it, section, you know, thought by thought, and I'm going to build the message around this. So, so again, it is 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. Okay, so this letter was written by the Apostle Paul. It was written to Pastor Timothy. So the church was new. This guy was on the scene, as set up as a pastor in Ephesus. And Paul was instructing Timothy of how he is to be as a pastor, how he's to minister, and what he's to teach. And so God's word to him is a word to me, which is a word to us as a congregation. So it's to us this morning. Okay, so here's the first arrogance, okay, and we're going to see this right from the text, we're gonna, starting with the first phrase, uh, 17a. So this is what it says, command to be arrogant or not to be haughty, okay? So let's talk about this a bit. So this word command, right, command those who are. So as a believer, this isn't optional, Okay, this isn't like, well, you know, if I do it, you know, maybe, maybe not. The word command is strong, saying, hey, if you are a believer, and most of us, if not all of us in here are, this is a strong command to us. Command those who are rich in this present world. Now, that little phrase, in this present world, tells us that those who perhaps are rich in this world now won't necessarily be rich in the world to come. There is not a direct correlation there, okay? Which also tells us those who are poorer in this present world doesn't mean that you will eternally be poor, however that works out. Okay, so there is not a direct correlation as to our worldly wealth. There is a correlation as to what we are laying ahead in eternity, okay, and we've talked about that. So he says, now, command those who are rich in this present world during this time. And you can say, well, Dave, I'm not wealthy at all at any stretch of the imagination, and this is also for you. It is for every one of us. Well, why would you say that? Well, in some ways, all of us are rich, right? I am personally very rich when it comes to a spoon collection, right? I have lots of clothes, right? I am rich, perhaps, with some educational opportunities that some other people haven't, uh, haven't had. All of us, regardless of your income level, are rich in some way. And if you and I think about our life outside of the American context, right? And I've been to lots of places, from Mongolia to India to Latin America to Africa. We are, worldwide speaking, now hear me, some of the wealthiest people in the world, right? We have a whole country in India, right, with... Um, a billion, 1.2 billion people, most people there earn a dollar a day. And this is 12 hours of work. When we were in Kenya this last summer, a really good wage, and these men and women were working from sunup to sundown, a really good wage in Kenya, $5 a day, right? 
We're not even talking $5 an hour. $5 a day if they can get the work. And so I want us to see ourselves not just through necessarily American eyes, but I'm asking all of us to open our eyes, okay, to understand how God sees us in context of the world. Have some wealth. So if you say, well, this isn't uh, intended for me, as your pastor, I'm telling you, it is intended for you and it's intended for me, okay? So command those who are rich in this world not to be arrogant, okay? And you and I have experienced people with greater wealth than us, right? Regardless of your income letter level, because there's always going to be someone else who has more money than you, right? Now, I remember, I grew up, we didn't have very much money, okay? My parents were divorced, and uh, we were on welfare for a while. We had to work, all this stuff, so I didn't grow up with a lot of money. But I remember in elementary school, I was so excited because... In third grade, I came with a box of 24 crayons, right? I thought, man, I've got all the colors of the rainbow, right? <laughs> Feeling pretty good. And they were new, and they were sharp, and they were Coro Corolla, right? Corolla? What is that? Corolla. That's what it is, yeah. <laughs> Crayola. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Lord, help me. Okay. <laughs> they were the name brand crayons. They weren't the generic ones. So I was feeling pretty good, right? Then out walks, I don't even know what her name was, Susie Q, right? She had the box of, what was it, 128 crayons? Remember that? With, and it had like a crayon sharpener in the back? What? So I hung down, my head down and did my 24 colors, and she's out there with an array of colors, right? right? And, you know, junior high, when you're, like, all insecure, like, I, we never had name brand stuff, right? All the stuff was Goodwill and garage sale and hand-me-down for my cousin, right? There's always someone looking better, right? All the stuff, you know what I'm talking about. And the nice shoes, right, and all that. And just, it goes on and on into life, right? Now, some people who are wealthier, they're not arrogant. I have really good friends who have a lot of money. I have some family members who have a lot of money, right? And um, so many of them are just, they're just like normal people, right? You would never guess they have a lot of money. They don't, you know, flaunt it. They're not trying, you know what I'm, you guys are, I'm getting not, a lot of nods, right? They use it well. They're not having it go to their head. And then there's those other people, right, <laughs> that, you know, hey, it's first class or no class, and they don't want to have anything to do with you. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? And they, like, oh, those people, and they treat everyone as their servant, and they're upset if things aren't perfect, and they're always talking about, you know, their this and that, and my car, and my cottage, and my house, and whatever, and blah, 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 kind of looking down, you know, at everybody, like those people, right? Wealth can do that to our heart, because we can put our identity into it and our hope with it, and we're going to see that. And so the command is, and by the way, I've, I've actually seen this with people who are poor, right? They get a great pair of shoes, they spend, you know, 120 bucks, right? And it's like the best thing they have, and they're like looking down at all those other people with ratty old shoes, right? You know, you know what I'm saying, right? It doesn't mean you have to be ultra wealthy. It's being arrogant about what you have, that does not represent the spirit of Christ nor Jesus Christ at all, right? And so we as a church and us as individuals, regardless of our income, we need to be and we are commanded not to be arrogant, not to think we're better than other people because of all um, that we have. Because no one likes being looked down 
upon. And it happens when we're even adults as well. One more story, and I'll go on. Uh, so when we were starting, um, we starting the church, whatever, 12, 15 years ago, it, you know, I was volunteering all my time. I was working construction. I was working, doing video stuff. I was selling stuff on eBay. I was working for uh, an auctioneer. And one day, I bought this Louis Vuitton bag, right? Anyone know Louis Vuitton, right? The bag's usually about, you know, 3000 to 5000 to $6,000. I'm like, oh, I struck gold, right? I could sell this, right? I bought it for like, I don't know, five bucks, right? I should have known better, right? But I, I didn't know, you know, I was like, oh, I wonder if this is real. So I was like, ah, oh, how am I going to know? I'm like, I can't tell the difference. I have no idea. So we, um, we had some friends here. And our, our daughters were young, so they're with us. They were probably junior high. And um, so we went downtown Miracle Mile in Chicago, right? All the nice stores that are there, you know, it's like everything is super awesome and super expensive. So there's a Louis Vuitton store there. I'm like, okay, I'm going to bring this in and ask them, okay? And so we go in this store, and um, it was, me, it was my, myself, my two daughters, Gretchen stayed outside wisely. And. Um, <laughs> And literally, I stood there for probably yeah, half an hour as all of these, you know, the look good, smell good people were coming in, all perfect, and, you know, the, their clothes were more than my car, and, um, and we, no one was paying us any attention, right, because they probably saw us and like, yeah, they're just window shopping, they actually shouldn't be in here. And it was actually pretty humiliating, and I was like 35 years old, right, and standing here with this box with this bag in it and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for anybody in this store to pay me any attention. I finally caught somebody and said, hey, you know, can, I, can you look at this for me? And she literally it took her like 10 seconds, like, yeah, it's fake. And she wouldn't talk to me and send me out. And I felt pretty, I felt horrible. I felt super poor. <laughs> I felt less than, my, I felt bad for my daughters to experience that. And it was a horrible feeling. And so, again, let us not be those people, right? Let us be people who engage with everyone, regardless of their income level, regardless of their education level, regardless of anything. I love that it was said about Jesus, and this was some of the Pharisees that told him that when they recognized that it's a good teacher, a rabbi, we notice that you treat everyone the same, regardless of their position. I love that description about Jesus. May that be true of us, right? We love everyone, regardless if they came in a limo or, or they walked here, regardless of where they live, regardless of anything. Let's reflect Christ by being humble. So command those who are rich in this present world right, not to be arrogant, okay? And so that's the first command to us. God, help us to be humble and use what is given well. Here's the second thing in this verse, second part of verse 17. Put your hope in God. And I've connected them together. You go to the next screen. So this is how it reads. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, okay, in the green letters, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so <laughs> uncertain. But to put their hope in God. So money is like a hope magnet, okay? And we are the tin man or the tin woman. It tries to suck us to it, tries to pull us away from trusting and hoping in God to trusting and hoping in it. And the truth is that wealth is indeed uncertain, unstable. Often it's here today and perhaps gone tomorrow. And we know stories about that. The truth is wealth is uncertain, but God is certain. <laughs> wealth is unreliable, but God is always reliable. Wealth is unstable, but God is an immovable rock. Wealth is not always present, but God is always present. 
But don't put your hope in wealth for your future, for your life, for your security, because it is uncertain, right? But put your hope in God. And we've seen this, and I have seen this, right? I have friends, I've read stories that when the stock market crashes or they get swindled of all of their retirement or they lose their job, they lose their identity, they lose their hope, and it destroys them. I'm telling you, Scripture is telling us to put our hope in God. For Scripture says, those who hope in the Lord will rise up with wings like eagles and will never be put to shame. So if your real treasure is in your bank account, you are putting your hope in the wrong place. God is the one who enables us to gain wealth. God knows the future, and some of your jobs are unstable, and you're wondering about the future. Scripture tells us to hope in the Lord. Now, there's another passage in in Timothy right uh, before the passage that we're looking at, and I'm going to read it for us, and it helps us and informs us as well. This is 1 Timothy. You can just look up the page. Chapter 6, verse 9 and 10, it says this to us. But those who want to be rich in this world, okay, and this is so common in every nation, people desire to be rich, right, because it thinks rich is better. Those who want to be rich fall into temptation, true, a trap, and many foolish and harmful desires, which plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Okay? Money isn't evil, okay, but the love of money can be the root of all types of evil. And this is true from lying to stealing to killing to all of this stuff. Often it's fueled by a love of many. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. And this, by the way, this principle is all over Scripture. Where even the parable of the soils, if you're familiar with that, God's word is being cast into various people's hearts or the soil of their soul. And one of those is a place in which the word of God goes into the heart, but the cares of this world or the desires for this world choke out that seed. The most tragic thing about people who, above other things, want to be wealthy and pursue it is that Often, they are running away from God as they are pursuing God as their money, okay? And they not only lose out in this life, but they lose out of on eternal life. So be truthful about your own heart, right? Do you desire to be rich, right? This is what you're going after, You're in for temptation and in for a trap. So this passage tells us as the church of God to examine ourselves. And I want you to examine yourself. Be honest, right? Ask God, God, what's happening? And I know plenty of people who have fallen into these traps. I have flirted with them myself in the past, right? God, help us to seek God above all things. And if there's something that you're trapped in, examine your heart, ask God for help, place your hope in Christ where it belongs, okay? So put your hope in God is the second thing. Thirdly, this is what we see in this text, okay? And this is the next point. Enjoy what God has given. Enjoy what God has given. So 1 Timothy Chapter, excuse me, chapter 6, verse 17, the last part of this verse. Who richly, okay, provides us with everything for 
our enjoyment. So let's read this together. I'll read it for us. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Now, I'm glad that this is in the text, okay? Because I have talked to plenty of people when they understand eternity and they understand their life in light of eternity. They're like, oh, I need to give every single thing away. And they feel, um, what's the word? They feel... They, they don't have the freedom to enjoy anything. They feel shameful. They feel like horrible. I don't have the freedom to do that because I'm being a bad Christian. Here's the deal. Right? If, if God is the Savior of your life, you're putting scriptural principles in place to your mind, to how you live your life, how you give, guess what? It's okay to enjoy nice things. Right? For instance... I have a vehicle that has heated seats. I love my heated seats. I turn them on almost all year, by the way. My freeze baby. I love my heated seats, right? I enjoy it. Guess what? God says, hey, enjoy it. I have a really nice pair of shoes. I'm going to tell you how much money it cost me. They, cut, they weren't these shoes. <laughs> it cost me 120 bucks for a pair of shoes, right? We went to a special place. They analyzed my feet. They're the most comfortable pair of shoes that I have. I bought them, and guess what? I enjoy them, right? I have a big screen TV in my house. <gasps> what, Pastor? You watch TV? Shouldn't you be praying all the time? <laughs> I do pray. <laughs> I do like sports. I do like movies. I do. I'm a human being, okay? Um, I enjoy that TV. I enjoy my couch, right? I have a heated blanket in my room, and I love sleeping underneath that, right? It's okay to enjoy some of your stuff. Like, if you have means to do stuff, have people, like, they bought a new truck, and they're like, oh, they're kind of, like, skittish. Oh, I bought this new truck. Awesome! Use it for the glory of God. Enjoy it, right? Now, how would you like it, right, at Christmas time, right? So, what, we have two daughters, or how old are they, 25, 26, okay? We like to express our love to them, if we can, you know, appropriately, buy them some gifts, Right? Right? And you give them the gift, you think about it, and you give it to them. I would, I'd, I'd kind of be put out a little bit if my daughter said, no, it's too good for me. I can't wear that because it's, I, I'm not worthy of it. And they take it and they put it in their closet and keep it there because they don't feel like they can enjoy it. I'd be pretty ticked at them. What are you talking about? I gave that to you, right? I gave it to you to enjoy. It's an expression of my, my love, right? God, in some regards, is the same way. He gives us Things. Did you check this? Do you see? Provides us with everything for our, what's that word? Thank you. It's okay. Have the freedom to enjoy your stuff. Not put your hope in it, right? Not put it above God, right? But recognizing this is the gift from God. It is okay. If the Lord tells you to give it away, by the way, give it away, right? I read a story about John Wesley. You guys know who John Wesley is? Some of you guys know who he is? He was a preacher in the 1700s, revivalist, incredible. And he spread the gospel all over the place. And there's a story about John Wesley who uh, went to a, a guy who owned tons of property, had these massive fields, and he was sharing the gospel with them. This, and they had this conversation and the guy was trying to impress John Wesley with um, all of his stuff, his stables, his horses, all of this land, property, blah, blah, blah. And John Wesley's um, uh, comment to this man was, well, you're going to have a hard time leaving all this, aren't you? Right? Because this guy put his whole identity in this, and someday he's going to leave it all. And so Scripture does tell us that it's okay <laughs> to enjoy some of our, enjoy our stuff. It's okay. It's even the will of God. This is Ecclesiastes 5. I'm just supporting verses here. 519. It says this, God has also given riches and wealth to every person, man or woman, 
And he has allowed us to enjoy them. Take his reward and rejoice in his labor. This is a gift of God, okay? So again, it's okay to enjoy the gifts of God. And you can glorify God in them. So I want us, and Scripture tells us, to avoid the two ditches as we're driving along our journey of life. One ditch is to make wealth our God and serve it. Scripture says don't do that. It's not going to lead anywhere good. Now the other ditch is not to enjoy anything on this earth. And some people do that, okay? And understand, uh, don't enjoy things. And they just get into problems on that side either. So have a balance, have a biblical mindset, give to God, and we're going to talk about giving to God a little more, but watch out for these two ditches. So in this passage, God is instructing us, right, instructing our heart, right, not to be arrogant, don't put our hope in wealth, okay, enjoy what God has given. These are together. And then he goes on in the next verse, verse 18, be rich in good deeds. So this is the next thing. And I want you to take one or two or three, perhaps all of these, put them into practice. So it says, be rich, well, how? In good deeds. First Timothy 6, 18. Command them, it's another command, to do good. To be rich, how? In good deeds. So here's the deal. I want you to be very, very wealthy people. Biblically wealthy people. The richest person is one who does the greatest good with what they have been given. Right? I want you to be truly wealthy, that is, be wealthy in good deeds, then you will be truly rich. Notice, Scripture tells us many things, but saying that we are created in Christ Jesus to do good things, to do the good works that God has prepared in advance for us to do. We don't earn our salvation by what we do. That is only by what Christ did. We put our faith in him. And then we have an opportunity to express our loyalty and love to Christ by following in his football. Football? Wow. (laughs) Jesus, the quarterback for the 49ers. Okay. Following in his... footsteps, (laughs) footsteps, <laughs> Freudian slip. <laughs> and living as Christ lived. Happiest people in the world, happiest, is that the right word? Most content, satisfied, it's probably their better word, are those who live like Christ, right? Titus chapter 3, verse 14, I'm just giving some supporting scriptures here, right? So you know, I'm not just, whatever, building something on just one verse. Uh, Titus chapter 3 says, and let our people learn. Oh, I like that. We can grow in this. Let our people learn, or what? To devote, devote, devote themselves. Dave's got to stop and take some more caffeine. <laughs> and my jaw's a little cold. Or my mind, we'll see. Okay, focus. Learn to devote themselves to good works. Devote themselves to good works. Now, this is, of course, devoting ourselves to Christ. And then in following him, he's given us stuff to do. Devote yourself to good works. Right? What can we do to make a difference for Christ and his kingdom here? So as to help uh, cases of urgent need but sometimes there are, and not be unfruitful. This is unfruitful in our Christianity. Salvation, by the way, is not the finish line of your life. It is the starting point of your life, right? Come into Christ, and then we follow him, right? 
There's zero unemployment in the kingdom of God, right? You all have something to do. I'll do. Do it. Do it. Do it. Be rich this way. Devote yourself. Hebrews chapter 10, I love this verse. And let us consider how to stir up or to spur on one another. Right? This is why we gather, right? To stir up one another. To what? Love. Good works, right? Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day, the final day when Christ comes again, drawing near. So telling us one of the reasons why we meet together is to spur each other on, to build each other up, to grow, right, towards love of all people and doing good things, good works. So be rich in good deeds, devote yourself to doing them, right? Ask God to show you, right? If you need stuff to do, you have my number, right? I'll get you, keep you busy. There's plenty of stuff to do around here, right? Do something, encourage each other, stir up one another to love and good things. Next in this verse, be generous, and willing to share. Be generous and willing to share. And to be, here's the verse, the next part of the verse, and to be generous and willing to share. So command them to do good, be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. So be generous, it seems pretty simple, willing to share what God has blessed you with, okay? These things are for you, but they're not about you, okay? for you, not about you. So generous, right? According to the Bible, there are three primary ways to do this. And Michael talked about it last week. I'm not going to go over all this, okay? But there, according to the Bible, there's tithing, which comes to your, goes to your church. Biblically, this is what is put forward to us. Another category are offerings, okay? This is beyond your ties to support other ministries and missionaries. For instance, like the Gideons or the Voice of the Martyrs or here in town, Pregnancy Care Center or various missionaries, including the blacks who are with us and the Delameters and other people. Give to these things. They're good, okay? It's a good way to be generous, okay? And also the third category in Scripture is alms. So there's ties, ties there's offerings, there's alms. Alms is meant for the poor, which could be including the Rockford Rescue Mission or Compassion International, supporting kids in other places, Samaritan's Purse, etc. Great ways to be generous. Lots of organization. Fish Able is another organization, right? Willing to share. Hmm. By the way, there's lots of ministry opportunities that you can support. With your finances, you can make a difference. We give away out of our general fund from our congregation thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. I'd love to see us give away more and more money, right, to impact the world. So when you give here, it just doesn't stay here. It goes all over the place. It's exciting to me. I want to see that grow. Now, willing to share is interesting, different than being generous, okay? The Bible tells us to... By the way, show hospitality to each other. And in your notes, I have lots of different scriptures. I hope you look up, right, supporting scripture. Show hospitality. And it also tells us to check this out. <laughs> Use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself. So that when it's gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. I bet you you didn't know that that was in there, right? Scripture tells us, hey, Throw a party, right? Open your home up to people. A good way to spend your money is on your friends. Do you know that? Now, it says gain friends. It doesn't say buy friends, okay? We have to be, we have to be careful, right? Because that does happen to some people, right? It happens. I, I know someone very intimately well, has a ton of money, and feels like they don't have any friends because they only come around because they have money, right? What would happen if they lost all their money? And some people, especially people with a lot of wealth, they often feel this way, that people want to 
go around them because they have money. But also on the other side, Scripture tells us to be generous with your friends, right? Have a party, have a football game, and buy the good pizza, right? The really good pizza. Like a pound a piece pizza, you know what I'm talking about? Right? It's okay. Well, wh why is this in Scripture? Well, because relationships matter eternally. Right? It's a good way to spend God's money in your hands. Now again, John Wesley, and I have a picture of him up here, who was a revivalist preacher, writer, founder of the Methodist Church, which is a lot different now than what it was then, <laughs> okay? He wrote a sermon, this very famous sermon. I have actually the place where I found it. I read the sermon. I thought it was great. It's called The Use of Money, and he had three very simple points. I'm not going to preach his whole sermon, but this is what he said, which makes a lot of sense. He said, make all you can. Save all you can, and give all you can, right? It's a great sermon, right? Make all you can, as in people say, well, money doesn't matter. I'm just going to, you know, pretty much not work and be lazy and whatever. No, that's not, Scripture doesn't tell us. It tells us to work that. It says, hey, make all you can, but do it not because you're, you know, at the expense of your health or don't pursue money. We know that, but hey, make as much as you can. It's okay. Well, Why? Well, so you can save all you can, and Scripture does tell us that it is wise for us to think about the future, to put money away. We don't know what's going to happen. Uh, it is actually godly of us to take care of the needs of our uh, immediate family. Scripture tells us as well that, you know what, you have to take care of the needs of your family. So save all you can. So earn all you can, save all you can. And give all you can, according to biblical principles, principles, because we cannot take our wealth and possessions with us, but indeed we can send it on ahead. And I recommended a couple of books to us way uh, in the first part of the series by a guy named Randy Elkhorn. And he has one called The Treasure Principle, and then he has one called um, Money, P Possessions, and Light of Eternity. That's the title. I encourage these books to you. And he said this, which I thought was really um, telling. It says, now ironically, many people can't afford to give be precisely because they're not giving. You can't read that, can you? Oh, maybe you can. Um, ironically, many people can't afford to give precisely because they're not giving. If we pay our debt to God first, then we will incur his blessing to help us pay our debts to men. But when we rob God to pay men, we rob ourselves of God's blessing, okay? I want you to think about this, giving all we can. I'm not talking legalistically, I'm talking biblically. And it's also interesting that uh, people will say, well, I can't afford to give. <laughs> and he's saying, well, you can't afford to give because you're not giving, right? And uh, like Michael and Naomi, Gretchen and I, when we were married, right, we had we were broke, broke. We were broke, right? But we believe what Scripture said. And so right off the top, we gave 10%. And it was a smaller amount then, right? But we have done this our whole life. No, it doesn't mean we haven't had financial struggles. We've had it. But God has helped us time and time and time and time and time again. And it's true that I've found that living on 10%, excuse me, on 90% or less, living on 90% or less with God's blessing is way better than living on 100% without it. That's my personal testimony and testimony of other people. So I encourage you to consider what Scripture has to say and follow it. And you will see God's working and faithfulness this way. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10 says this, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all you produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. You will have all that you need. Consider this. Put it in the practice. Let's continue on. Two more Two more points. Are you guys hanging in there? Do we need like a little coffee break? Okay. 
Hope you're not glazing over. There's so many points. I know, I know, I know there is. But this is in this passage, and we're going to go through it. Okay? So here's the next point. Lay up eternal treasures. Again, right in these verses as the Holy Spirit is speaking to us from 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 19. In this way, when we do these things, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. Which tells us when we give back to God for his work, money, God's money in our hands, when we give them for eternal purposes, it matters in eternity. It makes a difference now and it makes a difference then. And we talked about that a number of weeks ago. I can't imagine when I get to heaven, when you get to heaven, I can't imagine being there and regretting the money that I gave away for God's kingdom. Right? There, I'm like, I'm so glad I did that. Now, I imagine my thought would be, boy, I wish I would have given more. Because now we don't see it all clearly. Right? We get glimpses from this. So I want you to think about that day, and this is not, I'm not trying to guilt anybody, so hear my heart in all this. Imagine um, there, when I imagine that, it makes me want to be more and more generous. And sometimes I'm like, we're giving away what, right? And sometimes it, you know, you feel that, you feel it, right? You feel it. This isn't just like the extra money that you're not going to whatever, you know, you feel it, but I'm reminded and encouraged by scripture that I'm not living for this day, I'm living for that day, right, right, please think this way, I want, you know, when you get there, when I get there, you might get there before I do, right, I might get there before you do, it's going to be the day of all days, this is how we are to think as Christians and to live as Christians. God makes it very clear that we're going to give an account Him, salvation, and there's other things. We've talked about that a little bit. But think this way. And I gave you tons of scriptures here in the notes. Go look at them. Right? How we live our lives in the fruit of our faith. Right? Again, we're not earning salvation. It's the fruit that we are saved or we do have faith evidence that jesus is our king we live to serve him and become like him lay up eternal treasures and all this stuff is going away folks it's going away it's going away what's there matters so we can use what we have to impact now and eternity Here's the last point. Take hold of truly living. In this life, people say, I want to live the good life, which means boats and vacations and cars and clothes and jewelry and on and on and on. We call that the good life. Scripture redefines that and says, hey, let me tell you what truly living is. Verse 19, second part. So that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. The good life is not collecting as much stuff for yourself as possible. That's a lie. Right? The good life is giving away as much as you can. Jesus taught us that it is indeed more blessed to give and to receive. Often people say, I want to receive, I want to receive. You're asking for a less blessing. You know what, you know what a better prayer is? God, help me to give and to give and to give hilariously, amazingly. That's a better blessing and a better prayer. God, enable me to be a giver. To be a conduit of what you've given, God, it's all yours. Jesus said it's more blessed to give and receive. 
The truth is you'll get more joy from giving than you will receiving. And the irony is that if you give, God will bless you, right? All the more. I'm going to give us three scriptures and we're going to come to a conclusion. Here's some other things. I want you to highlight these in your Bible. Think about them, right? Here's one from Proverbs. Proverbs 11, 24 says, One gives freely, gives freely, giving away, yet they grow all the richer. Another withholds what he should give, and only suffers want. Well, this is like paradoxical. You give away and you get, but if you try to hang on to, you lose. This is what it's saying, verse 25. So whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and one who waters will himself be watered. Think about this. Luke chapter 6 This is Jesus talking, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. One real quick story. And so before we came to Rockford, um, we were up in Minnesota, frozen cold. It was crazy. Just south of Fargo. We're up there for four years. And the church had a couple parsonages. And uh, so a, a parsonage is a church, uh, excuse me, a church owned house. Okay, so I didn't have to pay rent as part of our pay package, but we did live there. And uh, I wanted to make some improvements of the place. And so I remember that we were giving, remodeling, doing all this type of stuff. And it was in the rafters of the garage. We wanted to, <laughs> so ironic have a place to store more stuff, okay? I was up there, and I was buying this plywood, and I knew I wouldn't get the money back. I'm making these improvements in somebody else's house, and I had a really bad attitude, right? I was sweaty. I was hot. I was full of dust. I'm like, you know, screwing in this plywood that I paid for. I'm never going to get back. And the Lord brought to mind this passage to me, just gently but strongly, Hey, Dave, give, and it will be given to you. Why are you worrying about this? Right? What are you doing? You had a snotty old, I had a snotty attitude, to be real honest. Right? The Lord convicted me, right? changed my mind up there, literally laying up there with my drill. I said, God, forgive me for my bad attitude. Help me to give and give generously, trusting you for whatever. That changed my mind. So if you struggle sometimes, think about these things, right? Is Jesus true or not? Are these verses true or not? Right? I'm not saying distrust God and I trust and you won't necessarily get it all back here, but believe me, on the other side, you'll get it back plus, 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 plus. 2 Corinthians is the last scripture we're going to look at. Paul was talking in this church and He concluded that section saying these words. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he or she has made up their mind. Not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And Michael talked about this verse last week. And God is able to make all grace abound to you. So that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in what? Every good work. So God gives us what we need to do his work, right? This verses have been abused by, by word faith preachers and televangelists. And I'm not trying to abuse this, but I don't want to leave it out at all because it's important. This is true. So make up your mind, pray about it, give joyfully, trust that God is going to use these things, and we'll see the results clearly in in eternity. So this is what I want you to do. It's the last we're talking on this. We probably won't talk about money again. The last time I talked about money was five years ago, right? It's like, I'm glad this series is done. But on the other hand, it's really important, right? Super important. And I would be, it would be spiritual malpractice if we didn't talk about these things. 
Lots more to talk about, but you talk, you examine, you think, and be determined in your mind what God would have you to do, and do it. Do it. Do it. Let's be hilariously generous, right? And so many of you are this way. Let's stir each other up to love and good deeds. Do these things. And if you say, hey, my financial life is, in a, is a mess, right? I'm going to try to help you with that. You probably saw a survey a few weeks ago. We have a class. It's, it's very practical money management by Dave Ramsey, okay? It's called um, Financial Peace University. I've gone through it. My wife and I had helped us a ton. We brought our kids through it. They're living these principles. Super practical, helpful is how to work with your money. And unfortunately, not many of us had these classes in school, like money management. It's just simple money management ways of working with them. And so if you say, hey, I need some help, sign up, fill out the survey, Crosspoint Connection, you go down a little bit, it's right there, click on it, say, yes, I would like to attend on a Tuesday night, a Thursday, whatever there it asks, and that will be helpful for you, okay? So I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to do a final song, and then I'll do a final blessing at the very end. And um, let's just pray, okay? So God, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you that you've helped us in these things. God, help us to remember what your word says to us concerning eternity and money and possessions. God, thank you for this congregation, God, and Christians throughout the ages who have lived by these principles. God, we entrust ourselves to you, and we trust you. God, I ask that you would help us to be hilariously generous, God. Do your work in us. Do your work through us in the world. So thank you, God, for what you've given. Help us to steward us, steward these things because we love you. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Do your work through us in the world. So thank you, God, for what you've given. Help us to steward us, steward these things because we love you. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.